Welcome to First Parish in Milton's live stream worship. It is wonderful that you have tuned in. That was Tim Steele, our music director. And I want to give a shout out to Eric Miller, who is making this audio visual experience possible. Yay! Thank you so much, Eric. So let's gather our focus, open our hearts to this time together, near and far. May the Spirit infuse us in place and cyberspace so that we come together, one and all, to this time. It is good to be together. We're going to sing our opening hymn today, Return Again. It's hymn 1011 in the blue hymnal. And what we're going to do is we'll sing it through all the way through once, And then Grace will help us, Grace Allendorf, our one Hunziker soloist, will help us. I will start the second, go through the second time, and Grace will come in for the round. Join in however you'd like. Return again. Again, 
I light this chalice. Let us say our call to worship together. Come, let us gather. We gather to celebrate the sacred within and among us. We come to seek spiritual growth and understanding. We strive to practice acceptance, forgiveness, and love. Together, we work to build a world with justice and compassion. Come, let us gather together. How many of you have ever seen the TV show Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? Then you know how the show begins. Mr. Rogers would open his door, come into his living room, pause, smile, and say, hello, neighbor. And then he would go to his closet. He would take off his fancy sport coat and he would put on a sweater. He was never in a hurry. He never got flustered. He took all the time it took. And then he would take off his fancy shoes and put on sneakers. Every show he would sing, Won't You Be My Neighbor? And that's how all 912 TV shows began. Each one patiently, gently, as he drew us in and relaxed us. Mr. Rogers was great at making those connections. He could connect to all kinds of people, children, parents, grown-ups who weren't parents. He even knew how to connect to Coco the gorilla. Coco was a gorilla who had learned some American Sign Language and thus was able to communicate with humans. One of her favorite signs was time, as if she were pointing to a wristwatch, and eat, time, eat. Well, Coco had a TV in her room, and she liked to watch Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So one day, Mr. Rogers came to meet Coco. Now, Mr. Rogers was not a big man. He weighed 143 pounds. He checked it every day, 143 pounds. Coco, on the other hand, weighed 280 pounds, almost twice as much. But no worries. When Coco saw Mr. Rogers come in, she went across the room and she stretched out her long, strong, black arms and gently, very gently, folded Mr. Rogers into a hug. And then she took his shoes off. So Mr. Rogers had so many stories about times that people had told him he had changed their lives. He had made a difference through the TV screen because he was gentle and patient and took all the time it needed to make that connection. One time he was in New York City on his way to Penn Station where his TV show was going to be taped. And he saw a little boy and the little boy was holding a big plastic sword, kind of like a lightsaber. And the little boy had zombie eyes because he was looking inward, looking at his imagination. And he was waving the sword around and making lightsaber noises. And Mr. Rogers looked at him. And then he walked over to him. And he got down on one knee in front of him. And he said, hello, that's a big sword. Now, the little boy liked to watch the kind of TV shows where superheroes save the universe with big, terrible weapons. The little boy did not watch Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and so he didn't know who Mr. Rogers was. His mother knew, though, and she was embarrassed. She apologized to Mr. Rogers for her son's rudeness. 
And Mr. Rogers really needed to get to Penn Station where lots of other children were waiting for him. But Mr. Rogers was patient. He stayed there on one knee looking at this little boy until finally the little boy looked at him and said, it's not a sword, it's a death ray. Oh, said Mr. Rogers. And then he leaned in close to the little boy's ear and he whispered something. And the zombie look melted out of the little boy's eyes and he really looked at Mr. Rogers for the first time and his head began to nod, yes. And only then did Mr. Rogers go on his way. And a reporter who had been with him and saw the whole thing happen said to Mr. Rogers, what did you say to that little boy? What did you whisper in his ear? And Mr. Rogers said, well, I said to him, do you know that you are strong on the inside too? I thought it was something he needed to hear. And I think that's what Mr. Rogers would say to us today. Do you know that you are strong on the inside too? You're strong and you can stand up to this challenge. You can find new ways to connect. There are many ways to say I love you. In this time when we need our family, our friends, our neighbors more than ever, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Laura Whitehouse, our Director of Religious Exploration. Thank you. Now we're going to give each other time of stillness. I wanted to mention something that Edgar Allan Poe once said. I remained so much inside my head that eventually I lost my mind. We need our whole bodies for this. We need to get out of the wondering and the waiting and the worrying sometimes and breathe into our whole body. Let our whole self have this experience, be resilient in this experience. So just let yourself squirm a little. Just be in touch with your body. And I want to share with you the beginning of a, uh, an exercise that was shared with me by Cynthia Winton Henry and Phil Porter of interplay.org. It's just the beginning. So if you can raise your hands up as you can and stretch gently up. And then if you're seated or standing, if you're seated, stretch down in your seat as well as up through your hands or down in your feet as well as up. Now open out as far as you can and hold your hands here. And then bring your hands in to a big old hug. Just hug yourself. And then put your chin on your chest and just do a teensy bit of a bow from the lower upper back. And back up. You know, you can hug yourself in this. You can massage your own shoulders. Let's do it again. Stretch. This time, if you can stretch a little far that, farther, that's good. If not, stretch up and down. Open your arms, and this time, picture someone you would like to hug right now, or a group of people you would like to hug. And when you have that image, wrap them in this virtual hug. Just hug them. And breathe, chin to chest, and down. Just a little bit. And up. And now let's let our arms go and have a moment of stillness together. Remember to breathe.
Blessings be. Good morning. I'm Tom Kemp, member of the worship committee. The reading this morning is Mutual Love by Sarah Moose Campbell. Loving is more than compromise and trade-off. It is mutual nurturing and growth. Love is more than trust in each other. It is trust in something that transcends human expectation. Love is the mutual gift of freedom with the mutual gift of commitment. Love is more than being true to ourselves. It is being true to a common reverence for life and a common vision of community. Love is more than loving each other. It is loving life itself. Many of you have probably read about Gabby Araiki, a 10-year-old fourth grader in Dorchester, who's been sewing masks for healthcare professionals. Stephanie Cave, an instructor at the Stitch House in Dorchester, has organized the effort online, calling the group the Boston Area Mask Initiative. That's love. On Friday, I was walking along the Neponset River Greenway from Mattapan to Milton, and on my way back to Mattapan, I noticed chalk drawings on the pathway that would be every five or six steps as you went down, written by whomever for whomever. And let me share some of the things that were written down. This is the order that I got them. Be thankful for what you have. We are stronger than COVID-19. Do your part. Social distance. Enjoy this moment. Written to encourage people along the path. That's love. And serving in the medical services, physicians, nurses, techs, assistants, orderlies, pharmacists, scientists, pouring their expertise and talent and time into this emergency, including the loved ones at home who are also serving in support of the front line in these times. That's love. The courage to love, courage to love life itself and open our hearts to the energizing, upholding nature of the cosmos that is also right in us, as Mr. Rogers said. We're born to respond from within. We're born with awareness and agency and responsibility. Response, ability. How are you? going to respond. What we do, how we respond, shapes the life we are in. If we take it from the courage to love, we will then find the humility needed to navigate these times. No one of us can get this through. No one of us can fix it all. We need to be responsive to one another. And in the courage to love, We see what we can do to help and are grateful to others who are doing the same. We recognize our mutual responsibility and take care of ourselves and each other. Because powerful love is mutual. It's balanced, self-respecting and other-regarding. If we're self-centered, we're not responding to the call of the interdependent web. But if we're overly self-sacrificing, then we're probably doing more harm than good. It needs to be balanced. Mutuality. Cooperation. We've got to shed the survival of the fittest myth that has been a part of our culture. That's not how our species will survive. Cooperation through the ages is what helped humanity survive. 
Our ancients huddled around the fire for warmth, community, and protection. We have to shed the notion of competitive survival and redevelop cooperative survival. Competitive survival is like hoarding, taking as much as you can before someone else gets it. No. Cooperative survival is taking what you need and giving what you can. Competitive survival is risking, risking opening businesses before it's wise or having crowded churches in Easter for the bottom line. No. Cooperative Survival is humility toward the virus and the expertise of those who can teach us how to navigate it. We have to shed the theology of scarcity, that there's only so much love around. No, the strength within is self-perpetuating, affirming it is a river of wisdom within us to guide us. The other day, a resident theologian, which course we all are, shared a story with me. She saw an interview and someone said, if you take the I out of illness and replace it to, with we, it spells wellness. Take the I out of illness, replace it with we, and you have wellness. We're not just learning about fear in this pandemic. We're learning about the depth of love we are capable of. Love of self, love of other, love of life. Hafiz of Shiraz, Sufi mystic of the 14th century, once said, I wish I could show you when you are lonely or in darkness, the astonishing light of your own being. We can do this. We can witness to that light. We can claim this love, the home of our soul. Take care of each other. Take care of yourself. Amen.
Let's join our hearts in the spirit of prayer. Holy One of all being, that which connects us beyond our imagining and yet is there within us, deep around us, wide and through us in our actions come to our recognition. Thank you for your presence, for upholding us, for sending lessons and guidance when we are open to it of how to be in this life and with each other. Let us open ourselves to this wisdom. And let us reach out prayers, all of us. Send the energy of affirmation. Prayers are not always what changes in our prayer. It's how we are changed in our prayer. Let us open our love and, asp and affirmation for medical workers, all of the medical workers and their loved ones that are doing amazing things. Let us hold them in our strength and love. Let us reach out our hearts to long distant truckers who are delivering for us and postal workers. Let us wish for wisdom and strength in our government officials who help us see the way through. Let us lift up strength and resiliency for all the parents now with children 24-7 and children now with parents 24-7. Let's give them resiliency and adult children with parents who they probably cannot visit at this time. Let's hold them in our virtual hugs. And the grocers. And all other folk. Who are helping keep us in this time. And for all the prayers unspoken. May we hold them in love. Amen. And now we have an offering, and we have a way of doing it through cyberspace. The offering this morning, which is March 27th, is going to be for Father Bills and Mainspring, which is an organization that helps the unhoused and homeless all of these uh, givings will go to that organization and I'm going to tell you how we do it. Take out your phone and text the amount you want to give, simply the number, to 617-539-7576. When you text that number, you're going to get all sorts of instructions on how to set up your own account. It's safe. What happens is all of this money goes to a First Parish account that is bundled for our offering, for our givings. Again, if you're seeing this after March 27th, this is only for this day, March 27th, that these monies will go to Father Bills and Mainspring. 617-539-7576.
And with this symbolic offering plate, let us say our unison dedication together. May these gifts be transformed into strength for this faith community, into comfort, food, and shelter for those in need. And may we be transformed by generosity. Now our closing hymn is the hymn we sang last week. Grace is going to help us through. She's going to sing it through once, and then we are going to sing it through twice after that. out to Reverend Julia Hamilton, Stacy Stone, and Claire Weichelbaum for those words. As I extinguish the chalice flame, may the flame of our faith burn deep and wide within us. May we remember that strength inside, know that is in others, and in our namaste distance, encourage one another through this time. Thanks for tuning in, and hopefully, when we're able to see each other again, we'll be able to see you here. You are all welcome to come to church whenever we will be able to do that. Have a good week. Amen.